Hello, hello, hello. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me. The incredible Tony Humphreys and Ron Trett, uh, <laughs> of my uh, biggest musical heroes. Uh, this this show is incredible. I mean, uh, we also I did an interview with Dr. Cornell West uh, yesterday that's going to be airing oh, on wow. the show as well. That's so, the uh, right there, boy. I have all three of y'all. Uh, in one uh, in one program, I think we're gonna teach the children a lot about what this music's about, where it's come from, and the importance of understanding that house music history and dance music history is black history uh, during this very special month. There you go. Uh, yeah, so again, I'd like to thank you guys so much. I mean, I mean for the viewers, I'd like to kind of say that uh, Tony and Ron have been two of the biggest influences of my life uh, wow, since uh, yeah, since I was a young teenager, I mean, wow. my, uh, my my stepfather is from uh, is a DJ as well, so I was listening to Ron and Tony's music through them. And um, I met Ron the first time at Melody's Memories, a record store I worked at in Detroit with uh, Danny Crivet when I was about sixteen. And Tony, we, you were just everyone, the man everybody talked about. <laughs> you know, we, we met recently. I had actually, no idea. <laughs> before, yeah, you had no idea how many souls you touched. Oh, yeah, man, but, come on. Tony, man, you got to know, bro. You, you <laughs> you know. Know, listen, man, the schedule I had, the schedule I had, I had no time to be thinking about anything else because, you know, it was like all week, you know, between the radio, between uh, doing the club two, three nights in the studio, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You remember them lockout days, right? Brother so I was, I was like married to my machines, man. That was it. <laughs> crazy, crazy you. schedule. So well, yeah. thank God you were married to those machines and those broadcasts because <laughs> you inspire so many people. I mean, I don't think this music would be here today without those Tony Humphrey bass lines. That's for oh. damn sure. <laughs> That's right. The master mixes, brother. Them long master mixes, brother. That, that's all oh I gotta say. God. Let me tell you. Wow. Let me tell you. Wow. You had a whole clan of people over here, man, in Chicago. You used to follow you with your follow oh, with your tapes. Goodness. No, seriously, man. One gets his tapes shipped over here, and the whole night, man. So yeah, we, you know, a lot of respect for you, brother. Well, I love respect. you guys too, man. I mean, without yeah. you, I couldn't have done those mixes. To tell you the truth, because yeah. y'all had the wicked tracks, and all yeah. I tried to do was play was play the classics underneath them Word. and just let them ride because it was easy to mix you know what i'm saying with Word. that this is fighting two live drummers all the time Word. So I had y'all, <laughs> and it was like oh here we go let me just set it up let it ride so Word. 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 That's, a, that's a very that's a very interesting uh kind of topic uh there because in the kind of history of uh house music and dance music um you know new york and the garage sound was a lot based off of disco records. And then Chicago came around with the invention of the drum machines and then uh, started its own version of house or started what we now kind of see as house. And uh, it'd be great to hear how you guys inspired each other. Cause I mean, really a uh, story I would say, or you guys correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, was really New York, Chicago, Detroit. Is that is that the truth in, in the lineage of how- Yeah, I mean- the basis for me is so it was it's basically so you understand what i'm saying that those were like the middle tracks to me you know no matter what was underneath you know what i'm saying there was a common denominator with that you know so, so like all songs start from the piano you know what i'm saying you build around it and then you know you put your song on top of it this and the other i mean that's that was basically it so we were all we all knew the same soulful records the same soulful artists you know it's just how it was presented that's all Right. You know, yeah. and, and they were, you know, way ahead of the game and they did it their way. And I was like, cool, now I got some tools. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, were you that talking about his, are, are, are you talking about historically, like how the how the story goes, more or less? Yeah, exactly. Well, I, don't I, yeah, mean, so, I don't know about this story, but yeah, no, so so Tony, like to, to like give you giving you tell you the, the, the story behind this, which is very interesting. So I actually um, handled the affairs of Mr. Robert Williams. Robert Williams is the guy who opened up the warehouse in Chicago. Uh, and he was a loft head because he's from New York. And that's what I am. See? And so that's he's a guru he, right there. Exactly. David, David right? Yeah, yeah, David. Nobody can touch that dude for me, man. That's, that's, hey, that's what I. <laughs> he turned me, he turned me out, man. He turned this church boy into like. <laughs> I don't even know what I am, but he turned me out, man. So, <laughs> word, word. yeah, so Mr. Williams, 
Frankie and Nikki used to go to the loft. And um, and so did Larry, obviously. And so basically what happened is Mr. Williams came to Chicago and on on the whim of some some friends of him, they wanted uh, of his, they wanted to throw a party. And um, so he came, he helped him throw the party, wound up staying. And then he went into business partnership with uh, uh, one or two of the guys because um, they kind of fell out or whatever the case may be. And then he wound up opening up the warehouse. And uh, he originally canvassed uh, Larry LeVan uh, to come and play in Chicago. And Larry was starting with the with the garage. Yeah. And uh, so, he, you know, Frankie was available. <laughs> and so the rest is history in terms yeah. of, you know, uh, how, how, how it works out. People... You know, people were talking. I mean, stuff was going on in Chicago for sure. Um, um, my father actually was a record pool director here in, oh, in the city. Wow. Yeah, uh, back uh, around 70, 77 to maybe like eighty or so. Um, and so, so you I got, got the good records. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 I was. I'm wasn't, sorry. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I wasn't even like into that shit, bro. I was like more interested in being a musician. I was a younger yeah. guy. I was going to the kitty yeah. discos and because I'm, you know, I'm a younger guy. So uh, I was around all the culture and everything, but you know, um, but in that time span is when Frankie was doing his thing at the at the warehouse, and then it was discos going on, and then Ron Hardy, who everybody's really beginning to learn outside of you know Chicago, was also doing his thing, but he was playing like smaller clubs. He was uh, played at the Den One, which was more like a gay disco that was here. And then the Ritz and a few other places, but when Frankie and Robert split, Robert canvassed Mr. Ron Hardy for the next iteration, which was the Music Box. Music Box, you. And uh, that's how all that kind of started happening. And it was really Ron Hardy. Now Frankie started the energy, right? But Ronnie right. was the one that was really playing a lot of this new stuff, uh, yeah. i.e., the Marshall Jeffersons of the world and Larry Hurds, yeah, that kind of thing. That. You know I what I'm saying? That story. Yeah. You know, so Frankie was into like Frankie was more. Frank was very like, uh, like how can I say, uh, next level avant garde. Like he was very tasteful. He was very artful with how he presented music. It kind of had to be, you know, very uh, produced, if you will. Yes. You know yes. what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, and Ron Polished. was a <laughs> bit different. Ron was radical, so he would be likely to play your shit because he was like more like. Rock and you know what I'm saying like rough like oh it's a rough demo okay let's check it out yeah. let's play it he was more like a mad scientist kind of kind of guy so the combination of these two brothers doing their thing man it, it spread out to the rest of the, of the city people got interested in actually being a one man band etc cetera, etc cetera. you know so that's kind of how it happened and then we served it back to you guys in New York <laughs> so, that's what happened. <laughs> Yeah, man. Listen, you know, y'all are responsible for house as far as I'm concerned, man. You know, yes, sir. Yes, that's sir. it. I mean, but even but it even started the at the loft. It started at the loft, though, bro. The loft, right. man. Seriously. That's it. Tony, do you want to tell us a little bit about the loft and the garage and, and Larry and um oh. and Frankie and how how that that uh evolution happened there in New York? And then over so to I'm, the not an, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert. I can tell you what I went through a little bit. But you was there. You was yeah. there. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Believe me. Every weekend, two, three wow. times. You know what I'm saying? Wow. So, uh, wow. yeah. So, I mean, basically, this guy used to throw law parties in his house. You know what I'm saying? And had his friends over. And, you know, I was working at a record shop called Downstairs Records at the time. And one of the people who work with me, Dave Rodriguez, uh, he used to work for Sal Soul. Okay, he did like the Candido album and all that stuff. And he said, you ever been to the loft? I was like, no, I was just a patron buying, you know, just buying stuff in the store. So he decided to take me. Hmm. And I walked into this room, you know, church boy, sheep's getting down, like have no idea what I'm walking into, you know? And I walk into this room and there are all these different types of people, you know, gay, straight, black and white, whatever, just dancing with each other. And there wasn't any mixing. He was just like basically yeah. playing one tune after another, you know, which meant that tune had to be really that great to play from beginning to end, you know? Right. And they just kept going for four, five, six, seven hours. And I'm standing there looking up like, I don't believe this. There's no fighting going on. There's nothing. Right. Nothing. It was just like, 
club heaven, you know? <laughs> right. And I was I was mesmerized by it, you know? And after that, I was hooked. I was hooked. I was hooked, line and sinker, man. So, and it was the variety because he has his record pool also. Right. That's right. where it started. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. you know, he had all types of things that nobody had, you know? And uh, it was hard to find. And I don't know. It's, I don't know what else to say. It's just it just blew my mind, man. That's all I can say. And then, of course, Larry, we're all uh, branches or leaves, I guess, off of that tree, you know. Wow. And, and you know, Larry took it to another level with the garage. Then all of a sudden, there's twenty five hundred people in a room, you know. And to party with that many people like that, to you know. Such different types of music from twelve to like one o'clock the next day. Mm. We'll talk about long sets, mm. okay? yeah. real sets. Plenty exactly. of times we went to sleep, woke up, there were still people dancing around us. You know, right? So right. That, that was another thing. You know, but, uh, uh, and the shows that they had—they were always crazy shows. Like you know, Patti LaBelle. I mean, really, you know, big top stars that would come and perform. So, you know, everyone was dying to get in there, dying to get in there, man. And uh, I don't know what else to say. Just great memories, man. Great memories. Incredible. Earlier, we were talking about sound system. And I've been to a, a couple of loft parties. Um, I think oh, I, yeah. I got, yeah, but not, not like obviously the original loft parties. Yeah. But they had, uh, they had the clip horn speakers. And That's I right. Know, and, and the, the original ones always had the clip horns as yes, well. Yes, they did. Yes, they Same did. Time same sound yes, and then we we're speaking about as well how at um paradise garage and at your beloved club the zanzibar you guys had a system from richard long exactly yeah. smaller version smaller room so and then later your residency at ministry of sound i think mean, you've always played on some of the these the best sound systems in the world I that's the standard man that's the standard. Well, from, that's what I understand, from what i understand yeah. they took the owner to the garage and they wanted to duplicate the garage so that's yeah. how that happened as a matter of fact i believe there's a story where they brought larry over himself and they got some specs from him they did so yeah that's what that's why there's that similarity yeah, you know did. yeah so, they how, how was how, how was it in chicago at the music box with the sound you know I've, I've heard stories about a dark room and people jacking on the wall but i never uh, really heard any well, story as about the sound <laughs> <laughs> let me let me explain so here, here once again the, the the two worlds of frankie and ron hardy frankie knuckles uh had the richard long system richard did the system in the in the warehouse uh, yeah. okay uh, he had the warehouse as well okay well wow. yeah and so um basically mr williams when he went and started the uh, music box he took some of the system for the warehouse to the first music because was, there's three music boxes there was one on 16th and indiana which was the first iteration of it the one that's the most famous is 326 underground uh it was under a little whacker here in chicago so basically because of the way it was set up it was underneath the the, the um the street the city of chicago because we have like an area where you can go and drive under under underground and so this place was underground that's why they call it 326 Underground. Uh -huh. So regardless of what weather conditions were going on, it was always you know, safe to go there, more or less. But it was basically like a cavernous room, concrete room, with you know just a whole bunch of speakers in it. And Ronnie was known for beating the hell out of you. <laughs> so it wasn't like, we ain't talking fidelity. We talking about getting your ass whipped by the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> like for real, for real. <laughs> like you know, like my brother, like my brother, uh, uh, Joaquin Classel, man, and that's my my dog. You know, they be like, oh, he's he's playing the system so hard. I'm like, you ain't heard Ron Hardy. <laughs> yeah, Ron Hardy would beat your ass. Meaning, like, I'm talking about the the speakers are aggressive, like the bass that's punching you in the the yeah. chest. That's it. And it that's feels like somebody's it. doing like this to you, that's like it. motherfucker. Yeah. And um. <laughs> That's and a very the, Midwestern in Detroit thing as well. Oh man, and the highs is like if they, you know, it's all it, it's 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 a <laughs> it's like doing all the things to you, aggressive things to you that you would have in a fight, except you like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way I can kind of describe it. Wow. So it's you know, and, and that was Ron, and that was Ronnie. Um, 
the, he was, uh, you know, I mean, he played the, and he was always working at EQ constantly. Uh, yeah. If you go back and you listen to his uh, take some of the tapes, that, you know, some people put some stuff up on YouTube and I kind of you can hear it. You know what I'm saying? But it all fits with what he was doing. It was radical. It was like a, it was like a punk rock club kind of situation, but with dance music. Yeah. You know, and he was play, he was giving you the highs and lows. He was giving you the, you know, the the you know the banging shit, and then you know he might quiet you down with something you know beautiful, whatever. But it you know he he was giving you life in there. If you know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> life is up. And down. He was he was that's, giving it to you. you that's know? what house music is about, though giving giving <laughs> yeah, people yeah. life. You know, <laughs> so much so the much of dance story. music and and the European dance music has become such a cerebral kind of situation where house music has always been about the soul and, and bringing you up and taking your body physically to places <laughs> even at, at yeah, frequencies yeah. and didn't know it, it could go. Yeah. Um, What's well, a tribal experience, man? Like what Tony was mentioning earlier, man, when you have a group of people getting together, dancing, singing along, it's a combination of, of church, uh, tribal oh, yeah. moment, uh, you know, and and you're feeling that spirit. We, That's you know, it. it's galvanizing to all that together, man. And That's I mean, it. Goosebumps talking about it actually. That's what, <laughs> That's what happens, man. It's like yeah. that zeitgeist happening. You're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it just turns into that. It's a spiritual experience. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel you. I'm, I'm also from a church family. My grandpa's oh. a Baptist preacher, and my oh. uh, uncle's still a Baptist father. preacher. There you go. Yeah, so I, I feel the spirit. I mean, I read a really incredible article. I was talking with this uh, with Dr. West uh, about how, you know, for so many years, I mean, out of the fact that uh, just kind of like the neighborhoods, black people in the <clears throat> police involvement, that the only place we could really make a lot of noise was in church. That's and then right. and then and then came along the club and that became a second outlet for black musicians and sound to then produce music. I mean, there's different versions of the club, the jazz club, you know, That's right. the, the, the shacks down in the South and all this. Uh, but at the same time, it was house music and the uh, the sound systems and these kind of, let's say, I don't want to say safe spaces, you know, that's been a use uh, term these days. But, um, but and it's true. Kind of, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. Really, it's true. Yeah, it's really true. But then, a really kind of interesting uh, point of the article was talking about how the gentrification of many of the neighborhoods in which house music clubs were in and then the kind of shutting down of these clubs or the gentrification of the music itself has kind of closed an outlet for uh, many kind of young people and a uh, new new uh, new generation let's say of um, black and uh, people of color you know uh, artists you know I know uh, when I was coming up in Detroit you know when I was a young kid. <laughs> Um, there is very few uh, of us left, and uh, you know the Martinez brothers and I. We had started a label. They, they, they also come from the same. Uh, you know, their dad Steve was a Paradise Garage regular, and uh, also they they their church kids. But um, do you guys uh, see a correlation <laughs> in uh, let's say? Because uh, I mean, you were in New York and Chicago, and um, when when did it really stop? where like people of color were going to house clubs and just kind of, and hip hop and rap took over everything. Cause there was- a, I think It was like 80, 80, 82, 83, 84 maybe. There was like competition going on and then it did like the flip. You know what yeah. I mean? As, as our generation, I guess, got a little bit older, you know what I mean? Then the big venues had more of hip hop and more of, of that, that type of stuff. You know what I mean? And plus the, uh, I think the gay community started moving around a lot too. They became very fragmented. You know, what I mean, it wasn't like just one big club. Then yeah. they spread into other little clubs. So, you know, I think I would say hmm, middle eighties. I would say around that's, that time. That's crazy because that's already like when people start to think that was proto house. Almost, you know, like right, you know, right. a lot well, of the story behind yeah. that was starting for us. How was, was it Chicago? Little, for us, it was a little different because um, house music was championing, you know, like it was the champion of the 80s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then, like, what happened it's here, which is WBMX, right? Yeah. WBMX was, uh, you know, happening in terms of, you know, on the commercial level. But uh, on the underground tip, what happened is uh, 
Frankie, you know, obviously he went to the power plant and then after he did the power plant, he would just do things here and there. He had the gallery, which was another spot that he had done. And then Ron Hardy was, you know, continued on Mr. Williams with the music box, which, came, which was rolling all the way really through the 80s, more or less. Uh, Ron Hardy passed at uh, the top of the 90s. Somewhere around, I want to say the late 80s, hip hop, because like hip hop wasn't really big here like that. You know right. what I'm saying? It was like, you know, you had cats that was just like listening to radio music, and then you had the weirdos like myself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We were the weird kids, bro. I mean, I was kids in this conversation. Right. You know, we were the cults, man. It was a cult. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I was like, you know, I live, I, I'm, I live on the south side of Chicago right now. You know what I mean? Um, I spent most of my time growing up, you know, on the south side and that kind of thing. So, you know, the dynamic of even having to go out the door is like, you know, you got to be ready for war, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And especially if you're a little different, you know what I'm saying? And and, and so in saying all that, uh, the culture here started to kind of take on this like hip hop kind of, you know, uh, yeah, you know, gangster, that, that shit started here maybe like around like, like middle to late, I want to say more late 80s. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, they they were more like, you know, the people that we saw that acted like that, they were kind of like, we never looked at them as being cool anyway. You know what I'm saying? I come from the like, you know, girls, huh? yeah, yeah, you know, they, they these these people that were into hip hop and this kind of thing at that time, they were kind of like, oh, y'all goofy. Y'all listen to commercial music. You know what I'm saying? This was the, this was the mentality. It's like, y'all just... Wow. You know, we're we're in the underground shit. We, you know, we taking we're tastemakers. And y'all right. listen, y'all listening to whatever come on the radio, whatever. You know, that, that was the attitude about it. But in order really to engage with uh regular everyday stuff, you kind of had to be plugged in or have some affiliations to be able to engage in the city of Chicago, more or less, because it's a gangster city. You know what I mean? But uh, there were, you know, people that acted that way because of lack of exposure. That's the best way I can put it. You know what I'm saying? And and the hip hop thing kind of just gave more of a soundtrack to that, man. I, I have to say, because it made them more like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, this is, you know, this like, you know, like, man, come on, dude. You know, it's, come on, you know. And back in the day, it was different because all the pretty honeys went to house music parties. <laughs> so... If they were a gangster dude, they kind of had to tone that down a little bit if they wanted to engage with a, a pretty, pretty female. You know what I'm saying? So um, that had a change. It it, cha it it changed things here, but middle age, really, yeah, definitely middle age. Exactly. Yeah. I have a question for you, uh, Tony. Having uh, <clears throat> been been on the radio as well, was there a um, you know? Because like for me, it's like. I, I look back at the histories of, of dance music and um, kind of the popularization of, uh, of rap music and then gangster rap. I had a really great conversation. I, I did a kind of a talk like this with uh, Chuck D um, some years ago in uh, at IMS in um, in uh, in LA, and uh, you know we were talking about how there was a um, a concentrated effort, <clears throat> let's say, to popularize some of that uh, that music. And uh, inside of the radio, you know, did you because you know house music was all over everything. And then at some point, I, um, I they, they kind of took not only house music but black music. I know I had the Kamitsky Parkas uh, incident in, in Chicago. You know, the day they uh, yeah. they took yeah. disco off, but they really steamed out. Off, yeah, all, yeah. Took, took, steamed out all the black music uh, off the radio. Um, you know, and I, I've always kind of in, in my mind as well, like. Uh, kind of looked at that um, as a point of of really trying to um, let's say shape uh, black culture in a, in a different way, you know, because it, it this is definitely a choice to uh, to change that um, that musical kind of stylizing on on the radio and and have a real concentrated push towards gangster rap or towards rap music. I just wanted to see how you inside the radio, you know, having played on the radio, was there any point that you got pushed out 
for this other music or that they wanted to change over? The, well, I uh, guess that happened, that happened to me at Hot 97 uh, <clears throat> in the early 90s, okay, mm. like 94, 95. Mm. Okay, that's exactly what happened because I used to, let's say, air from 10 o'clock to 2 in the morning, and it began where, you know, the hip hop guys would come on afterwards. When it got to 94, 95, okay, then all of a sudden they were on, okay, from 10 o'clock until two in the morning. Then I'd be on at like three or four or five in the morning. So that's where it did the flip. Yeah. You know, mm. but, uh, you know, it was interesting where I was at KISS because KISS was the beginning of promoting like hip hop stuff. Like we had BLS, which was like the black station, the black owned station, Frankie Crocker, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But Kiss was the one that was playing all the like fat boys and all this other stuff that was going on at the time, run DMC, blah, blah, blah. But I was on the weekend, so I was the oddity, okay? Mm, I okay. That's how that happened. Uh, maybe that's why I got some of the attention I got because, you know, I'm playing all this garage stuff and this is supposed to be a hip hop station, you know? Mm. But uh, so you know, the last I mean, early hip hop was also so heavily influenced by disco music yeah, as well. Listen, I used to, to the play max. Both, man. I used to play both. I mean, because you know, well, the rule was whatever was on the playlist, you know, you had to have some one, one or two songs from the playlist within 15, 20 minutes. You had to do that so they could sort of kept their audience or you know something familiar. So I'd be doing crazy mixes like, you know, Run DMC and Lolita Holloway or something like that, you know, hit and run, like, you know, but I mean, it worked, you know, and um, like Red Alert, that's a bad dude, boy. Yes, it is. Like yes, one, it is. One of the best ones I know that can play house music and hip hop music, <laughs> and he can play anything and it fits. I just don't know how he does it, but he does it smoothly, smoothly. <laughs> So, um, you know, but yeah, in the beginning, I had to play both. I mean, I had to play both for sure. And then after a while, I said, you know what? Ain't nothing I can do for hip hop, man. Let me just keep on doing what I'm doing. It got so big. Ain't nothing I could help it with, you know, or influence. So that's when I stuck with like the R&B stuff and the soulful stuff. And again, being a church boy, you end up choosing elements that you don't even realize that you like, you know, because, you know, when you're in the choir, I mean, I went to Catholic school first and then I, you know, I used to go to, you know, Baptist church, you know what I'm saying? My mother was a usher, and my, my stepfather was a deacon, you know, so I saw both sides, wow. you know, and after I did this uh, interview, I forgot, uh, I think for Red Bull or something like that, it really dawned on me, all these records that I either mixed that I was picking out or I was playing, they all had gospel tones in them. <laughs> they all had gospel backgrounds in them. And I, and I shocked right. myself. I was like, man, what a common denominator. I did, I never put all my tunes together, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and see what the similarity was. And I was like, you know, like Teddy said, you, you, can't, you can't hide from yourself. Anywhere you go, there you are. Real talk. So, <laughs> that is, that is <laughs> the, the truth. I That's find it. myself becoming the 16-year-old at the record store more and more every day. <laughs> hey. If it had some background singing in there, it had some organs or any elements of church, it was going to be played. Solo, <laughs> piano, forget it. It was going to be played. Go. I was I got, solo head. <laughs> I, have a, I have a question for you because we talked so much about, we were talking about the histories of all this music, and it got us to the uh, early 90s and mid 90s, late 80s. And which for me, I know so much of you guys is uh, music from the 90s. You know, that's really when Underground House was taken off. I mean, to, uh, Ron, Ron, you did Altered States, and was that 86? No, nah, 80s, oh, shit, man. I actually did that record in the 80s, and it came out in 90. Wow. And, I did, and I did the record when I was like 14 years old, believe what? it or not. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, I was like a freshman in high school, man, when I did that shit, bro. Wow. So, and, you wow. know, but that, that, that's what we would do back in the day is we would make tracks that would kind of set us aside from everybody else. You know what I'm saying? We would always, you know, if we couldn't get records, we would buy records, of course, you know what I'm saying, to get records. But if you wanted to set yourself aside, you know, from being like different or whatever, you made your own tracks. Of if you course. Were. Of and course. so I, you know, I mean, this is one of the things I had dialed out. I dialed, dialed a whole bunch of, I had a whole onslaught of stuff, but that was the one that was set Chicago on fire. All right. 
And, um, yeah, and, you know, and then it, uh, you know, uh, my friend, uh, who's now passed on, Amando Gallup, <clears throat> he, um, Yo, Mondo. yeah, 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 he's, yeah he's, 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 Armando, yeah. Armand, for anyone out there who's listening to who, who we're talking about here, yeah, from tracks, warehouse records, warehouse was his label, right? Yes, it was, yes, he was, yeah. and uh, he stepped to me, and uh, you know, I was like holding on for dead life to this track. I was like, I don't, you know, because I didn't really, you know, I had all heard all these horror stories, everything about like, you know, people with tracks, out their right? records. Yeah, oh, man. Oh, I was geez. like, oh, nah, I ain't, I ain't putting shit out. But no. model, yeah, model talked me into it, and my man Terry Hunter. Um, that's and, another bad dude right there. Yeah. Jesus oh, Christ, Jesus, yes, he, he's still doing it now. Yeah, he's killing me. He's killing yeah. me. Every yeah. week. <laughs> see that that was our generation of uh djs and producers the guys i came up with you know and uh i was the younger brother of the squad you know and but anyway he talked me into it as a matter of fact terry and i just did this interview a couple of weeks ago and terry was telling the story how he came to my mother came to my house and talked to my mother <laughs> about, <laughs> about talking her into you know it's like amando's gonna do us right and, da, 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 da. And, and he did that and we put it out amando and we got screwed, but you know, oh. it's just, oh, wow. it's just, it was the story, but you know, I mean, it, what it was is that we have young guys and, and we were uh, getting uh, the distri distribution was through Gherkin records. Oh, and Gherkin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that was, that was, uh, for the, for the listeners, uh, Gherkin was a uh, uh, Larry Hurd uh, project, correct? No, it was actually Brett, uh, Brett Wilcox was the owner. Okay. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I, I know and, he put out a lot of records on Gherkin, though. Right? Yeah, he did a lot of remixes and in, 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 in a couple of productions. You know, what I'm Gherkin saying? Jerks, right? Yeah, Gherkin Jerks and uh, Monde yeah. Oliver, Monde Oliver, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, Monde Oliver for sure. Yeah, yeah. And, yellow uh, label, red label, pink label. Yeah, there, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, man. I mean, we we got we got we got burned, man. But um, and it, it happens it, it, to everybody, man. It's like you pay your debt to society, bro. That That's way. It's like, you, do. <laughs> you come in, you got to do it, you know. But mine happened to be my first entry into into to the business, which blew me up on a certain level, gave me a certain level of uh, visibility. But man, dude, I wound up having to sue this Dutch company years later, who you know uh -huh. were claiming the rights of it, you know. And then I found I saw the paperwork. And it uh, somebody had forged my name on the, the paperwork. Oh my God! So it went that deep. You know, but uh, you know, I, I had to sue him. You know, because it, it had gotten ridiculous. My 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 tune was on. Um, Don't uh, tell was, me Morning Factory. Nah, nah, nah. Um, it was uh, the the altered states had gotten licensed. This is when I knew it was bad. Uh, because now you know, of course, my man Moody Man has got his. He's on the Grand Theft Auto. Well, my tune was on Grand Theft Auto Liberty Cities uh -huh. years before. And I didn't know anything about it. And then somebody, one of my younger guys, told me, he said, man, you know your song is in, in one of the, the rooms? Because they had these different rooms you could go to. And Alter yeah. States was part of the soundtrack. And so after that, man, I had the suit. Yeah, and I come to find that it had been licensed like 50 times. You know, they just they just went crazy with it. You know, they just hoard it out, you know. So, yeah. but uh, that's, you know, called being young, being in the business, you know. Yep, yep, yep. It happens, you know. But, well, I got a question. When did, when did, when did you and, and Q do their happiness record, man? Oh, man. That was just a, a trip uh, to London. And we, ah. we did, we did New, Year's, New Year's Eve together. Ah. And um, my man, uh, Alex uh, Aurelio, who um, uh, runs Need the Soul, that was the party that we were playing. Okay. Uh, he was like, man, I want to get you guys in the studio. So uh, that that's what happened. Bad, man. Bad, 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 yeah. Bad, that, bad. that was that was the session. That was yeah. the session. Speaking yeah. of very, sorry to continue with you, Ron, but speaking of very famous partnerships, we can't have this conversation without talking about you and Shay Damir. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know that's <laughs> yeah. I mean, great, one of the most fruit, fruitful uh, production partnerships in the history. Yeah, of man. We we also, we. Also, we, you guys just with Maurizio, with Maurizio and uh, Basic Channel. You know that's that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm your brother. Yeah, I'm your brother. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a, yeah. That's them crazy tracks I used to use all the time, man. Stupid. <laughs> 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 You want to get hyped, or you think you get a little bit too mellow? Hey, wow. man. 
you know? Yeah, yeah but Shay, Shay and I were really on a mission, man, to try to uh, kind of upgrade the Chicago image on, on the level of, like, some of the music that was happening. Because, you know, we had gotten into this thing, like, Chicago got into this thing of being tracky, track-oriented. And we were, you know, um, consummate students of New York and, and that kind of thing. Shay had lived in New York. I hadn't moved to New York yet. But, um, you know, I was... Uh, in New York, really? Yeah, wow. man, I, moved, I lived in New York for like 10 years, bro. What? That's right. That's, what? Right. That's when, I, when I did my giant step residency and all that kind of stuff in the, in the, in the, uh, the uh, late, well, no, actually the start of 2000. Is when wow. I started, yeah, but I, I really kind of moved to New York around 96, 97, I want to say, is when I went in. What part of New York, man? I'm sorry. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, bro. That's right. I live right on Fulton and Classen, homie. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Right on Fulton and right Cal. in the heart. Yep. That's right. So um not not Fort, you know, not Fort Green, but uh what did it call Clinton Hill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And back then it was uh it was just kind of on the fringe, man. It was like I, as a matter of fact, I lived across the street, like literally from where my man where Biggie used to sell drugs in Christmas Addicts Park. Really? Right there. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was still actually that block was like still hot. I got my car broken into twice. You know, oh, God. It, was, it was a crack whore like spot, like like oh, the block. Man. But you know, um, nice support. You know, I, nice place to be. And eventually, not like now, of course, it's a million dollars to even buy anything hey, over there now. You know, I'm still in New Jersey, okay? So yeah, that's but, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but, but yeah, man, we 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 were on a mission just to you know bring fidelity to to you know um, to the music that was coming out of Chicago. That's what that was you know what our mission was. My man Cashmere was um, was our distribu uh, distributor. We had offices. Cashmere was upstairs. We were downstairs. Oh, uh, yeah, man. And we you know we would go to Detroit and record in uh, Kevin Sinus's million dollar studio. Oh, don't talk about Kevin, man. Yeah. <laughs> I used to say he was the most underrated producer I knew oh, at yeah. the time. I true. mean, everything from other stuff, from soul to tech to all tempos to Jesus, there was nothing he didn't. Who I yeah. remember that album he did like it had like no bass lines in it, but it was still wicked. <laughs> it's just yeah. crazy some of the stuff he did. So wow. you know, well, I, love you guys. I love all you guys. Listen, it was so crazy. You know, it's funny we didn't speak to each other unless it, we met in Florida at some of the conferences or something like that, right? right. That was most of the time where DJs and producers finally met each Engage, other. The exactly. that they played. But once a year, okay? Right. But my setup at Zanzibar, I had like about maybe eight, nine rows of, of records behind me. There was a specific row with nothing but Chicago stuff in it all the time and double. So. There you go. There you go. <laughs> had more of y'all every track possible, every song possible, you know. And anytime something seemed like it was getting like not energized, pull up another track. Used to See? pull up two at a time. See, wow. the mixes, man. Now, so now, it was camaraderie. Here, here's here's the truth of the matter. So Chicago had a lot of talent, as you already we we discussed. Yeah. New York had the platform to get the word out to the rest of the world. Yeah, and so that's where the power of New York is. It's like oh. it's you know when it's played in New York, then it has arrived, and then everybody you know because you have people coming in. You know, Chicago's a metropolitan city, no doubt. Course, I mean, you course, know, but course. New York is like everybody's there, right? So if it's if the word goes out there, then it kind of goes to Europe, blah 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 blah. And Chicago had kind of felt like in terms of venues and that kind of thing, we didn't have those platforms anymore. Everything went extremely underground. Oh, right, yeah. okay. and then you had this scene when we were just talking about the hip hop in the, the late nineties, and yeah. uh, I, I'm sorry, early, late eighties, yeah. early nineties. Yeah. What started happening then here was that you had more of the loft scene going on, which was what was happening is you had more of a younger suburban type of DJ that was happening. Okay, uh, the non. Well, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah, where, where would, would Derek Car Where would Derek Carter fit in? And that, 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 that era. Yeah, that era, right? That era. That's right there. And um, Derek He's was- crazy too, man. That's another crazy one, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Derek is, uh, was had been around, <laughs> and he was the leader of that. 
and he was a leader of the, the, the kind of like law scene kind of kind of thing and Mark Farina. Mark and, Farina, yeah. And uh, my, uh, Spencer Kinsey. Uh, um, yeah, so, so, yeah. So the, 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 that kind of era is like the, 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 the early 90s kind of going into the mid 90s. By that time, you know, like I said, Ron had passed away. Frankie and Knuckles had moved away. Uh, and so there was a new generation of, 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 of music listeners, people coming from some suburbs now, you know, going to the parties versus like the underground Chicago, you know, black, you know, music scene. So they're, they're, they're like, you know. They, they try to duplicate the same thing. That's yeah. basically what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then Tony in, in Jersey with uh, Zanzibar, you know, we also have some other legends there. Uh, Carrie Chandler, I know is a, a, from Jersey. Um, yeah. Was he coming down to the Zanzibar uh, back he in the brought, day? He brought me a cassette of Drink <laughs> On Me, a cassette. And that's how that came out. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Okay. That's, that was like sort of the beginning. For sure. Carrie was quite, quite young when he started as well, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was a kid. He was, yeah. he was oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And then he was down with uh, James Bratton, One Eleven East for a while. Uh, I don't know. He was he was just doing so much stuff, man. I mean, man, he was putting down the numbers. It was like he was from Chicago or something. The amount of stuff <laughs> he was putting down. <laughs> yeah, Kerry was like, man, look, like five packs I... every week, man. You know, but uh, yeah, Kerry. still today he's he's still still crazy prolific. Um, indeed, so, indeed. Yeah, so, but, uh, Tony at, at Zanzibar, because I know we we were talking a lot. I just want to get some more from you there to talk about uh, the club and how long it ran for for the kids at home. Because I'm trying to teach, I'm trying to teach teach, teach the children today. You know the, the <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you gonna come out here and learn today. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, look, I was a part of a you know of a great place that had a lot of great DJs, okay? It was an underground club, but it was a big club. Uh, normally like 1,500, you know, two floors. Uh, stayed open late hours. Um, that was one of the <clears> things <throat> that I wanted to prove to myself that to be able to play in an underground club, you had to be able to play for three sets, the length of three sets, mm. okay? So like, let's say I would start at like, you know, 12, 30, one o'clock and stop maybe like around hmm, about 3, 30, four o'clock in the morning. And then we'd have a show or a PA as they call it in the UK or whatever, right? And then after that, after the show was over, now first you had the people who came in from 10 o'clock that were partying downstairs, came upstairs at one o'clock in the morning because they want to see the show. They spent their 20 bucks or whatever because they want to see the artist or whoever the artist was. Right. After the artists performed, they, they were tired. They went home. So then you had all the other underground people there who was dying for them to go. Like, go home, y'all. Go home, y'all. And that's where the second set would begin. The second set would begin like around 4 o'clock to like about 6.30, 7 o'clock. Okay? Then at 7 o'clock in the morning is when it would be the third set. And the third set was always like the loft where – there wasn't really any mixing involved. You just played the best tunes possible. As if wow. you were in your house, like you're playing choice tunes. Wow. Okay? It was not about mixing at all. It was like the best R and best quality tunes that you had. You would not play no if records, B side records, maybe <laughs> records. You no, know, oh yeah, this is this is gonna be this is gonna be hot. No, I mean it was like you playing the best stuff possible then until everybody decided to go home like probably around 11 10 11 something like that <laughs> the real we had, there was church downstairs and, you know we as a matter of fact the owner used to i mean the uh manager used to give me the keys and he would go home because he'd been there since the day before and we'd always get complaints from the church people downstairs like what's going on with all that noise so what we used to do oh, was so zanzibar was on top of a church no, one of the rooms on the in the lobby was used oh. as, as yeah for for a uh, church gathering. Wow! So like you a can Sunday. imagine on a Sunday. So wow. we closed all the doors. I locked all the doors, and I would keep only like about sixty people in there, and we just go until we got tired. Wow! Wow! 
that was the thing. So some of, some of them felt special, like, yo, man, I want to stay till afterwards. I want to be here at 9 o'clock. <laughs> you know? And again, it wasn't about no mention. It was just, you know, it was all about, like, you're going to play Quincy Jones. You're going to play, like, real stuff on that sound system. It was like, what would you like to hear on a 9,000-watt system? What would you <laughs> want to hear what would you play in your house or your car that you would want to hear with 50 people 60 people around on that sound system mm -hmm. that was the mentality wow. you know if you're gonna play love is the message you playing the whole thing and these people are in it like it was a ritual okay wow. now this something comes in boom, boom, boom. that's it well that's right. 1973 that's the oh. baddest dance record ever made still <laughs> To this day. day, to this day, 1973. Tell me another 19. Tell me another record of 1973 that's being played like that right now. Yes, sir. <laughs> can't go over one. You can't. Yeah. 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 Plus, oh. I'm a big Philly head anyway. So you know, what can I tell you? It's nothing like you know, Gamble and Huff and Earl Young and all those cats. You know. Oh man. Which is My you know. God. Early sound soul, so you know what can I tell you? I'm from God Black Music Experience. That's it. That's to the it. max. To the really? max. That's Philly right. International. It's Philly not tempo R and B. It's That's all it is. We come from is. real bands. We come from real bands, and then it got electronic. Okay, which is nothing wrong with that. But the middle tracks of it, you know what I mean? The core is always going to be soulful stuff. That's it. Always That's it. slow, fast. Still the same. Avant-garde black music, soul music. That's I it. think that's, that's, that's a great, I think that's a great place where we can uh, leave See, off. It's all about the tempo. Yeah. When people ask me, you know, well, how would you describe, you know, house music? I was like, it's all about the tempo. It's just at a faster tempo. If you slowed it down, it'd be called something else. Wow, it'd be called R and B. <laughs> it's up exactly. That's it. That's it. Wow. Wow. That's it. So you know. We ain't gotcha. no than when we were kids. We just played it, you know, at a faster speed. That's all, a faster pace, faster BPM. That's, that's, that's how I look at it. And then got yeah. all church. When it got to like 129, 130, it was church. <laughs> you know, that was it. <laughs> one, two, one, two, tambourine. Right. Don't, be the, don't be the pussy cats, man. You yeah. know, tambourine. So. <laughs> Good stuff and good time, Jack. That's it. <laughs> That's right. I, I, I just want to thank you guys so much. This has been like the most amazing conversation. I've got some text messages to say we got to wrap it up a little bit. But okay. I just want to send all the love to you guys. I mean, this is oh, like wow. a dream, a dream I mean, come true. Here. It could be going yeah. on for another five hours, man. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah, please, because you know, we <laughs> time so they can hear you guys mix too. So <laughs> for the show. Yeah. I'm just so I'm so very grateful and thankful to be able to share this time for you and to hear these oral histories. It's so important, I think, that we talk about how this music started and these very candid conversations being amongst uh, you know fans and peers. I mean, of each right. other. I mean, it's so beautiful also for me to be able to continue uh, this story. You know, I think it's really my part in the, this culture to kind of keep these stories going and to well, keep this uh, this soul alive. Generation, you know, it's it's really um, so important for the people to understand that this music is soul music, that it's black music, that it's avant-garde music, and that it has a history beyond today, and uh, right. and it's going to live into tomorrow. So I just wanted to thank you guys so much again for being here. Uh, if there's any last words you want to say to the children today, or for the people listening, the children. Uh, <laughs> the children. <laughs> Hey, go ahead, Tony, man. You, you, did, you know. What, what can I say? What can I say? Uh, if you're going to perform for a crowd, don't forget the women. <laughs> Biggest mistake DJs make. They try to be too, you know, bravado, and they forget the women, make them work too hard to enjoy themselves. That's it. That's and that's the words from the Grandmaster right that's there. The prof, <laughs> that's the most prof. Hey, man, you, you're absolutely right. I, I remember you said that in the interview before, too. That's and right. That's, uh, correct. Absolutely correct. That's it. So, only thing I would say is uh, uh, younger generation is study the greats, study the masters, study the people that come before you. 
there's a long and lustrous history here and there's no reason for you not to be able to get the information because it's now more available to you before we had to go out and get it wow we had to go out and get it oh yeah you know what i'm saying now would, you can go on the internet you can get books whatever there's no reason for you not to have this information you know what i'm saying and do it like what my young brother is doing here man is curating things to spread yeah, the information it. you know so that's why we appreciate him for passing and, it along and, you know? hey keep it moving brother that's what that's that's all we got that's it that's it yeah. at the end of the day so yeah. much respect man thing. much respect much respect to you guys thank you guys that's so up. much you got thank it man i'll speak to you all soon I have, thank okay what you know thank you bus all Good right. Night. See y'all. <laughs> wow.